Well, President Obama has become the first sitting U.S. president to visit the Japanese city of Hiroshima since U.S. warplanes dropped the first atomic bomb on August 6, 1945. The bombing killed 140,000 people, and another 100,000 were seriously injured. He spoke today uh, at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. Uh, we're now joined by Setsuku Thurlow, who is a survivor of the U.S. bombing of Hi Hiroshima in 1945. She's a longtime uh, anti-nuclear activist who lives in Toronto, Canada, where she joins us. Setsuku Thurlow, welcome to Democracy Now! Could you take us back to that day, uh, you, you as a, as a, as a child uh, in Hiroshima, and tell us what happened? Well, I was a 13-year-old grade 8 student at the girls' school, and I was mobilized by the Army, like, you know, together with a group of about 30 schoolmates. And we were trained to act as a decoding assistants. And that very day, being Monday, we were to start the day's work as uh, a full-fledged decoding assistant. At 8 o'clock, we had the morning assembly, and the Major and I gave us a pep talk. And we said, we will do our best for emperor's sake. And at that moment, I saw the bluish-white flash in the windows. I was on the second floor of the wooden building, which was one mile uh, or 1.8 kilometer away from the um, ground zero. And after seeing the flash, I had a sensation of floating in the air. Uh, all the buildings were flattened by the blast and falling, and obviously the building I was in was falling, and my body was falling together with it. That's the end of my recollection. Then I regained my consciousness, and when I regained, uh, I found myself in the total darkness and the silence. I tried to move my body, but I couldn't, so I knew I was faced with death. I thought, finally, Americans got us. Um, then I started hearing the whispering voices of my classmates who were around me in the same room. Mother, help me. God, help me. And all of a sudden, strong male voice uh, said, don't give up. I'm trying to free you. Keep moving, keep pushing. And you see the sunray coming through that opening. G get moving toward that direction, crawl. And that's what I did in the total darkness. I didn't see anything. But by the time I came out, the building was on fire. That meant all my classmates who were with me, about 30 of them, were burned to death alive. And I and two other girls managed to come out. Three of us looked around outside. And although it happened in the morning, it was dark, dark as twilight. And as our eyes got used to recognize things, those dark moving objects happened to be human beings. It was like a procession of ghosts. I say ghosts because they simply did not look like human beings. Uh, their hair was rising upwards, and they were covered with blood and dirt, and they were burned and blackened and swollen. Their skin and the flesh were hanging and parts of the bodies were missing. Some were carrying their own eyeballs, and as they collapsed onto the ground, their stomach burst open and the intestines start stretching out. And the soldier said, you girls joined that procession, escaped to the nearby hillside. Well, we learned how to step over the dead bodies and escape. By the time we got to the hillside, at the foot 
of the hill was a huge army training ground about the size of two football fields. Quite a big place. The place was packed with dead bodies and dying people, injured people. And the people were just begging in whisper. Nobody was shouting in a strong voice, just in whisper, water please, water please. And that's all the physical and psychological strength left. They just whispered. We wanted to be of help to them, but we had no bucket and no um, cups to carry the water. And we found ourselves relatively uh, lightly injured. So we went to the nearby stream, washed off our dirt and the blood, and tore off our blouses, soaked them in the water, and dashed back to the dying people. We put the wet cloth over the mouth and who desperately sucked in the moisture. That was the level of rescue. Uh, relief work uh, we were able to offer, nothing else. I looked around, see if there were doctors or nurses helping. I saw none in the huge place. Of course, the doctors and nurses were killed too, but a small number of remaining uh, surviving people were working somewhere else. So thousands of thousands of people at the place where I was, uh, they had no medication, no water even, and no medical attention or anything. That's how most of the people died. And when the darkness fell, we three girls sat on the hillside and all night watched the city burn, feeling stunned and numbed from watching the massive death and suffering all day. We weren't feeling, we weren't uh, responding appropriately, emotionally. We were not able to, and it was a good thing we were not able to respond emotionally. If we did, we couldn't have survived for each horror we had to witness that day. Setsuko Thurlow, talk about the days that followed, the effects on people, not just of the immediate bombing that killed so many, but then the radiation effects. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my father was out of town, so uh, he saw the rising mushroom cloud and he came back to the city. And my mother was doing the dishes after breakfast and she was rescued. So I was lucky. I had both parents. Uh, uh, later on, we moved to outside of the city and where my uncle fed us, housed us, and fed us, and clothed us. We were lucky. Not many people had that kind of luck. They just uh, spread a piece of old paper or cloth on the ground, and that's where they slept, without knowing anything about the effects of uh, radiation. Uh, from the contaminated ground. But I, we found that my sister and her four-year-old child were on, uh, on their way to the doctor. They were walking over the bridge in the central part of the city that day, and uh, they were badly, badly burned. And uh, we saw them the next day. We could hardly recognize them, only by their voices. And according to my mother, by the special hairpin she had in her hair, she recognized it was she. But anyway, she survived for four, day, four days, four nights, and the child died shortly after. Uh, but uh, we supposedly looked after them, but we didn't have anything to give except some fluid. Uh, 
and my sister-in-law, who are directing student uh, work uh, in the center part of the city. There were about uh, 8,000 grade 7 and grade 8 students from all the high schools working in the center part of the city, just below the detonation. And they are the ones who simply vaporized, uh, melted, and the carbonized. And my father and I looked for the body of my sister-in-law, who was directing the students there. We never found them. She's still missing on paper. Uh, but uh, we were so happy. My favorite uncle and aunt survived, we heard. And they were outside of the city. Tetsuko, uh, and they if have I can interrupt you for one second, we only have about 30 seconds. Could you uh, respond to the visit of President Obama to Hi Hiroshima, uh, the importance of it for you? For me? Um, yes, uh, because his presence satisfied many people uh, because he went to the cenotaph and paid respect. I think that was very satisfying to many survivors. And, but the message part, everybody anticipated great message. So did I. And, but, of course, it was a huge disappointment once again. He made a beautiful speech in Prague, and I guess we were all hoping something like that would happen. It didn't happen. It was a huge. Anyway, Setsuko um, Thurlow, we want to thank you for being with us. We'll continue this conversation and post it online at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.